Good evening all, and welcome. I've got a huge announcement. I had the absolute pleasure to work with the channel Dark Echoes. They are an absolutely amazing channel that produce live action horror stories. It is some serious hard work and incredibly well produced. I'm so glad that I had the privilege to work with them. The first story in tonight's video is completely live action and instead of listening, I would really appreciate it if you could watch it. Of course, it's being narrated by me. It's really good, really dark. I'm sure all of you will love it. And it's a let's not me kind of story. So please check them out at the end of the video. Their links are all in the description and a link to their channel and another of their videos will be at the end. So please show them some love let them know you came from Mort, and enjoy. But for now, get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. This is my dark confession. I guess I'm what you'd call the black sheep of my family. I've always had interests and pursuits that weren't aligned with my family. They were religious. I was agnostic. They were family oriented. I was a loner. They went to college and became professionals. I flunked out and fantasized about starting a metal cover band I'd call Nine Inch Nihilism. When I was 27, my girlfriend dumped me and I moved back home. During my season of failure, there was a lot of tension with my parents. My melancholy attitude and refusal to get a job weren't doing me any favors. Things seemed on the verge of boiling over. And then, something happened that changed all of that. My uncle got into a serious car accident that left him in a coma, hovering on the verge of death. My mom and this uncle were extremely close, and she was devastated. She dragged me to the hospital, and we basically moved into his private room. Other relatives came and went, including his wife, who went home each night. But mum and I were there nearly around the clock. For three days, I endured the drudgery of waiting for someone I didn't even like to slowly die. But then he surprised us all and pulled through. My mother was elated. The emotional floodgates opened and she cried awkwardly in my arms. When he was cleared for visitors, my mother wanted to see him right away. But her nurse informed her he already had a private visitation in progress with his legal counsel and that they'd let her know when it was finished. An hour later, the same nurse came into our visitors area and informed us that my uncle had requested to speak with me privately. I don't know who was more surprised, my mother or me. A little backstory here. My uncle and I have zero relationship. The few interactions we have had were generally adversarial. He was the most hoity-toity of all my relatives, a paragon of the Christian rights family values, Mr. Faith, family and community. He was a multi-millionaire success story, and I was a loser he looked down upon my entire life. We had nothing in common whatsoever. At least, that's what I thought when I entered the hospital room. My uncle looked like he was a single held breath away from death, but he was surprisingly lucid. He acknowledged our past differences, and essentially owned up to being an arrogant blowhard for my entire childhood. He then paused for a long, pensive moment, like he was having second thoughts about what he was going to say. And then he began. He explained that he would have to remain in the hospital for a few more weeks. He still had several more surgeries scheduled, and there was a considerable chance he might die in the process. He then looked me dead in the eyes, and told me he needed me to take care of something for him. Something delicate. I knew whatever he said next was going to be fascinating, and he did not disappoint. 
He explained that he had a secret property upstate, managed by one of his shell companies that nobody knew about. Inside, he had something that would damage his legacy if it were discovered. He wanted me to remove it from the premises and dispose of it, and he was willing to handsomely compensate me for my effort and discretion. I won't bore you with the legal specifics, but essentially he arranged with his lawyers the following. Upfront money to cover my expenses, an immediate payout of $50,000 upon providing proof of completion, and a trust to ensure that I took his secret to the grave to the tune of $50,000 a year for the rest of my life. Needless to say, I accepted his offer. I walked out of the room and told my mum I had a friend from school that needed some emergency help, and started driving north. Back in the hospital room, before my uncle told me exactly what he wanted removed, my mind raced with the possibility of what it might be. Proof of a crime? A snuff tape? evidence that he was in the clan. The reality was just as dark as any of those. I arrived at the nondescript house in the country. I expected something menacing and brooding, but this property would be best described as quaint. I entered with the provided key and went straight to the thick metal door with a protected glass window. As I peered through, my opinion of my uncle would never be the same again. Sitting there, Alone, hungry, thirsty, and likely scared out of her mind, was a young woman. Now I realized the moral thing to do would have been to immediately contact the authorities, and to ensure my uncle was exposed as the monster he truly is. But like I said, this is a confession. And it was easier than you might expect for me to rationalize my decision to follow through with removing her as my uncle requested. And not just because of the money, although that was most of it. There was also my mum. It would destroy her to know the truth. She would never recover. My uncle's instructions were very specific, and I followed them to the letter. I fed her, gave her a fresh change of clothes, and then gave her a drugged bottle of water. After she was incapacitated, I removed any evidence of her restraint system, and then loaded her limp body into the van. It was an eight hour drive to my destination, during which I crossed three state lines and became a human trafficker. At one point, she started to wake up. I assured her I wasn't going to hurt her, and she was going to start a new life, and that she would never go back to that other place. I gave her more food and water, non-drugged this time, and after she started to relax a bit, she opened up and told me her story. She was 15 when she was abducted, and eventually sold to my uncle. It happened at a shopping center in Reykjavik, Iceland. She was in a parking lot, waiting for a friend. It happened so fast, she didn't even scream. The last public place she ever visited was a candle store. I gave her one more bottle of drugged water as we neared the destination. It was a rundown motel outside a major city, the kind that accepts cash and was littered with junkies. I carried the girl inside and set her on the bed. There was a distinctive painting on the wall above her, and I positioned myself so that both the girl and the painting were in frame and took the photo. This was the proof requested by my uncle to ensure that I had taken her to the correct place. As she lay there, I was captivated by her unique beauty, her blue eyes, her pale skin. I took out the syringe. It contained a lethal dose of fentanyl-laced heroin. He wanted me to leave her for dead in the hotel room and make it look like another downtrodden soul threw her life away. A few minutes later, my new account showed $50,000. I left the hotel and drove straight back to my home state. By this point, I hadn't slept in over 24 hours, but I drove through the night fueled on fear and adrenaline. It was morning by the time I arrived, but I didn't go home. I met with a realtor about buying an isolated farmhouse with a large, unfinished basement. It was done. I would never go back to being who I was only a day before. 
I felt weird about it for a few weeks. But then my life recalibrated, and this became my new baseline. That was three years ago. My uncle ended up pulling through several surgeries and a few months later, he left the hospital. As for me, it's nice having my own place. And somewhat surprisingly, I actually visit my family more than I expected. Don't get me wrong, I'm still the black sheep. They're still religious, I'm still agnostic, and they're still family oriented. And I'm still, well, I'm not really sure what I am. I just know that I don't have a lot in common with them. Except my uncle. We do have this one thing, and I don't mean first hand knowledge of his darkest secret. No, I mean something else. I have my own secret now something no one else would quite understand. See, I didn't inject the girl with fentanyl. I took her with me. And I've kept her contained in my now finished basement ever since. Like I said, this is my dark confession. We all have our secrets. My name is Lily. At the time of writing this, I'm a 20 year old woman who lives with my boyfriend, Ben and our three cats. We live in a two bedroom, two bathroom apartment on the third floor, right next to the outside stairs, and can very easily hear anyone walking up or entering the apartments around us. Our room is right beside the front door, and the window looks out onto the wooden stairs slash deck area. A little background slash context. A little less than a year ago, I had a stalker. I met him on a popular BDSM site and made it very clear to him from the beginning that I wasn't interested in anything serious, strictly a friends with benefits type of relationship. He was a little odd and admitted to me he had autism, but I didn't care. I had plenty of friends growing up and currently who were on the spectrum and were still functioning members of society as most are. I hung out with him frequently because of the sex, but also because I was 19 and he would buy me booze with my money. I worked two jobs during this time, one retail and one food service. People at my retail job knew him and suggested very heavily to me prior that he wasn't a great person and to be careful. I started distancing myself from him when he began talking about his severe mental illness specifically his predisposition to schizophrenia. I told him he needed to seek medical attention if he thought something was wrong and tried supporting him. I tried backing away completely when he admitted to me he had dreams of murdering me and my parents dog, murdering him and having flashbacks to Auschwitz where he killed children in a past life. Lovely. I immediately cut contact with him, but made sure to record calls and voicemails. When telling my retail co-workers about this, they told me that the behavior was not new. Ben and I had just begun seeing each other at this point, but he as well as my parents strongly encouraged that I filed the restraining order. I told them that I would think it over, but it was solidified when he showed up to my place of work just to get food. I hid in the back of the restaurant and told my shift leader I couldn't go out there until he was gone. I could tell he was skeptical, but I said it was fine as long as I stayed busy in the back. I called Ben while back there to inform him of what was going on, and after heading up, resumed my job. Ben showed up minutes after and made it very clear to my stalker that I didn't want to see him, but did not threaten him. My shift leader later told me that while making my stalker's meal, he looked two co-workers in the eyes and said, I know Lily is in the back hiding from me. My uncle is a retired lawyer and therefore helped me take proper action against him. My stalker's lawyer and my uncle worked together frequently before my uncle retired and struck a deal with my attorney and uncle that if we dropped the charges, he would put the fear of God in him. After all of this, I have yet to see him again six months later. Ben and I are both night owls and also pretty antisocial. It was around 1130pm 
and Ben and I were chatting quietly with the lights off in our room. There was a natural lull in our conversation when we were both on our phones and there was suddenly a knock at the door to the tune of a shave and a haircut. We both froze instantly and stayed silent. There were a few more seconds of silence then the knock repeated. This pattern continued for about five minutes before I started freaking out silently to Ben beside me. We were both stark nude and were expecting no one. Ben and I quietly walked out the room and to the door looking out the peephole and saw no one. We were still freaking out and walked to the kitchen and both grabbed steak knives to give ourselves some semblance of a safe feeling. When attempting to go back to our room, the knock happened again twice more and Ben ordered me to get in the bedroom and hid just out of sight in case something got ugly and needed to surprise attack whoever this was. He looked out the peephole again and before I could ask him if he saw anyone, he flung the door open and walked onto the balcony, still naked. I hissed at him to get back inside and he did just that before locking the door again. He said no one was there and proceeded to lock us and the cats in the room for the night. We really hope it was a case of someone having the wrong apartment. When telling my parents they were pissed that I hadn't called the police, saying it very well could have been an attempt of burglary, of what little valuables we own. Small side note, my nine year old sister lives with our grandmother in the same complex and building, but a different apartment. I pushed and asked if she had attempted pranking us, ready to tear her a new one about how she could have been hurt. She very heavily insisted she didn't because she had to be up early the next day for a summer camp trip. Whoever knocked on our door at nearly midnight for all of our safety, let's not meet again. My husband was a trucker with a cross country firm at the time. His driving partner separated from his girlfriend and according to my husband, couldn't afford to get his own place. I did find that odd as he made as much money as my husband who clearly could afford the roof over our heads. My little one was a newborn and I was off on maternity leave. So buddy moves into our spare room and makes himself at home. And I do mean at home. He'd walk into the living room and change the channel while I was watching TV or turn on the stereo, fry himself a steak as a midnight snack or eat an entire box of donuts and thought nothing of it. He'd take a shower and drop his dirty clothes on the floor for me to pick up and wash. And he stared at me a lot. I found him creepy and inconsiderate and told my husband so. And finally, after a few months of arguing about our unwelcome charity case who never paid a cent, I told my husband it was either him or me. This sparked a huge argument between the two of them with Buddy accusing my husband of being whipped and not standing up for his friend. That did it for my husband and he told the guy he needed to get out now. My husband drove him to a hotel and we thought that was the end of it. The next day we went to get groceries as I had stopped buying anything but essentials so Buddy would eat us out of house and home. Imagine our shock when we get home and Buddy walks out of the kitchen wearing my husband's clothes and smoking his pipe. As you can imagine, feces hit the fan and I went straight to the kitchen and phoned the police. In those days, there was no 911, so it was taking a bit and he heard me talking. He bolted out the house and we never saw him again and he never showed up at work either. We discovered that he had broken a basement window to get in, so we boarded up the basement and changed the locks. Around a week or so later, I decided to use my cash nest egg that I had stashed in my underwear drawer and it was gone and I realized several pair of my underpants were gone as well. Gross. I considered phoning the cops again at that point, but we decided we didn't want to remind him of our existence. And we moved shortly after. I hope the next tenants never got an unexpected and unwelcome house guest. I was a domiciliary carer in a small town in the UK. This meant I had to go from house to house to provide personal care and support for elderly and disabled people in their own home. 
my shifts were variable from a nice and easy short to a lengthy split shift. This meant I started at 7am in the morning and finished at half past 10 in the evening. One day my manager called me in the office to have a meeting about a couple of new clients, which a few had fallen off my route that day. She handed me over the care plans and other files including care notes, where you have to document everything you have done to the client on the time of visit, including personal care, housekeeping tasks, and documenting medications. So she told me to have a nice late shift and sent me back to work with the brand new client. As I found the address, I was a bit creeped out by the look of the client's house. It was a detached two story house with an untidy abandoned looking garden. Windows were opaque from years of dirt built up on the glass panes. The staircase windows were covered with sheets of building site plastic wraps. And I opened the gate and walked to the side of the house where the main entrance was. The door was a simple UPVC door with a door cam fitted to the right side of the frame with a doorbell button. I pressed the button, heard the doorbell ring inside and shortly after a vicious dog barked from inside. A few moments later, a middle aged man looked out of the window from my right side of the door and asked me, what do you want? I introduced myself as Frank, and that I was from the care company, and that was here to help him in his daily life. He reluctantly let me into his home. And as I entered the hairs on the back of my head started to rise. The inside of his house was a huge mess. Dog hairs covered the floor in thick layers. The smell of untidiness was overwhelming. I need to describe the layout of his home for you to understand. As I stepped in on my immediate left, there was the staircase leading to the upper floor, barricaded with a child barrier. On my right were a wardrobe for coats and shoes. In front of me were the door of the living room and the lounge. And on the far right was a short lobby leading into the dining room and kitchen. So my client invited me to have a seat in the lounge and we started to talk. The guy seemed okay. And I had a chat with him mainly to convince him about the service we provided. And he needs it because of his living conditions. The conversation went fine. I had spent my allocated visit time just to make him comfortable with the service we provided. Everything went fine. So my unease had gone and I realized my allocated visit time had drawn to an end. I had to say goodbye to the client after I was done with my care notes and I have another route for the next few weeks and had completely forgotten about that creepy house and the rather creepy man to take care of. When I noticed in my schedule that I have him again for two hours to spend like cleaning his home and such no personal care was in sight. Because this client was very shy. When I go I'm given the task to vacuum his dining room, which I started doing. But the vacuum cleaner didn't work. I wondered why I turned the vacuum cleaner over and saw all the brushes were thickly covered with dog hair. I cleaned it out as best I could and started to clean his dining room out when a big chunk of gray carpet was ripped off by the vacuum cleaner. I freaked out. I had now destroyed his carpet. When I realized his carpet wasn't gray at all, but a nice magenta. It looked gray because of years worth of dog hair stomped into the carpet. I grabbed a knife and used it as a spatula to try and get the dog hairs out. When I loosened up the dog hairs, I started to roll up the carpet. It was so thick. I took it out to the front yard as the backyard was an utter jungle with overgrowth and weeds, as well as other vegetation. It was impossible for me to move in the backyard. Then I was greeted by his next door neighbor, Jack. Hello, how are you doing? Are you moving Joe out? He asked as I returned his greeting and said, No, I'm just cleaning out his house. I'm only here for domestic reasons. Well, good luck with him, Jack said. The unease had returned to me, but I tried brushing it off. I managed to clean his dining room and make it look like a dining room instead of a dog kennel. And I wrote in my care notes and moved on to my next client. The following week I had him again. And my next task was the kitchen. So I started to clean up the rather messy kitchen. The washing up sink felt like I was working in a sewer instead of a sink. 
when I finally managed to clear up the mess and clean and tidy Joe's kitchen cupboards, I went to rinse my cloth out when I saw him standing at the kitchen door. I did not realize the situation at my first glance. So I turned to the sink to rinse the cloth when I felt a chill go down my spine. He had a machete in his hands, grasped very tight that his fingers were going white. I looked at him and he stared at me, but not with a glaze of a nice gentleman, but with a glimmer of insanity in his eyes. I glanced at my watch and my visit time was near its end. And I said, look, Joe, my visits over. My other clients are waiting for me. Will you let me write my care notes and grab my coat and car and leave? He didn't answer nor move. He just kept staring at me with that insane glance, my eyes darting between him and the machete. I moved forwards towards him and he backed up, but kept staring at me with the insanity in his eyes that got worse with every second. I went into the lounge, not taking my eyes off Joe, in case he were to charge at me. I grabbed my coat that had contained my car keys and flat keys and my ID, put it on then slowly walked out of the lounge. Joe was standing at the lounge door with the machete in hand ready to stab. I walked steadily towards him and he backed up into the kitchen's lobby. To my best of luck, as he forgot to take his keys out the main door, as I walked towards the main entrance, always facing Joe, I reached the front door, turned the keys and opened it, backed out, down the two steps he had in the front door to the driveway. He started to come after me, but stopped at his front door and he slammed on his front door so hard that the glass plane just exploded out the door. I backed up to the front yard's gate, then opened it. When Dredd got down to my very bones, his dog was unleashed and charging at me with a throffing mouth. I was able to shut the main gate right before that dog reached it. The dog collided with the gate with a very loud crash, barking at me ferociously. I opened my car, then started it up and didn't even care about traffic on the main road. I reversed into full throttle and then sped away from the creepy house. I wrote everything down on my notes and all that they said to me was, oh, he has a mental illness. A few weeks later, I was sacked because I refused to work with him again. I was about five years old when my dad and I drove up to my sister's high school to pick her up from sports practice. He asked me to walk to the gym to tell her it was time to go home. It wasn't dark outside, but it was well after school hours and there weren't people milling about on campus. Everything was quiet and there was no one around. I was walking along this outdoor breezeway when this older man approached me. He had dark wavy hair, a big mustache, tight jeans, and a paisley brown and cream shirt. I can still see him in my mind today. He stopped me to supposedly ask directions somewhere, and then he started asking me other questions. He squatted down to my eye level and asked me how old I was, what grade I was in, and finally what my name was. When I told him my name, he said, Hey, that's my name too, isn't that cool? And I believed him and asked if he could walk with me. I remember feeling very uncomfortable and intimidated, but I was going to go with him anyway because he was an adult and it never occurred to me that I didn't have to go with him. I was supposed to do what adults told me in my little kid mind. And if I didn't, well, it meant I had bad manners and I took pride in being a polite and well-mannered child something other adults would often compliment about me. And then there was the fact that he had been nice to me, so I didn't want to be rude to him. As I started to walk with him, my dad suddenly came rushing up, took me by the hand and said something in a harsh tone to the mustache man. He quickly turned heel and walked away fast. And I remember being confused because even though he made me feel weird, he had been so nice and friendly. And now he was rushing off without even saying goodbye. Still, I was relieved that my dad was there because it meant I didn't have to go with this man who made me feel uncomfortable. I come to find out my dad was parked in a place 
where from his car he could see me still. So when he saw the man squatting down to talk to me, he knew something was off and that I could have been in danger. With the benefit of hindsight as an adult, I feel without a doubt that this man was a child predator. And I shudder to think what could have happened had my dad not seen what was going down and come to my aid. I grew up in rural Texas, in a small town, with a crippling meth problem. No positive outlets for people to do activities like a movie theatre or park, and we didn't even have a large grocery store just to hang out in. The teens mostly just ended up drinking, driving and going to bonfires. But quite a few of the teenage boys in my neighbourhood decided that being evil was the best way to have fun. They would literally go out of their way while either trying to drive and swerve and scare younger kids riding bikes, or poison loose dogs and even set fire to a few of the trailers in my neighbourhood, while people were still inside them. Only one arrest was ever made in connection to the arsons, but it had definitely been a group activity. In my neighbourhood was a trailer park, in which each trailer was placed on a few acres of land, with at least some forested area between each plot of property. The road was an older dirt road with gravel and rocks poured over the dirt, which is what I had to learn to ride a bike on. It was difficult. One day when I was around 10, I was doing my best to ride the bike on this rock road without falling while riding away from my house when I saw my older sister, who was about 16 at the time, sprinting alongside the road towards me from the opposite direction. I was going very slow, trying to keep my balance, but decided to just get off the bike when I noticed how panicked my sister looked. I saw a dust cloud coming from the road, but a fairly large hill was blocking the view of my sister from any vehicles that were coming towards us. When my sister got to me, she grabbed my arm so hard that I winced in pain and she pulled me away from the bike. By this time, the truck that was producing the dust trail was just coming over the hill, but it was still fairly far away, so I didn't think they noticed us. There are woods around 10 feet on both sides of the road, where I and my sister were, as my sister was pulling me into the woods on the left side of it. I complained and was asking her what was going on, but she told me to hurry. We made it about 30 feet into the woods when my sister dropped to the ground and pulled me with her. She covered my mouth and told me to be quiet. Again, I complied, and I saw the vehicle she was worried about. A black truck filled with five guys that were in their late teens or very early twenties. The truck screeched to a stop right where my bike was, and I froze solid when I heard my sister whisper, Crap. Three of the guys got out the car, but they didn't say anything. It was clear that they were looking very intensely into the woods on both sides of the road. Luckily, for some reason I'm not sure of, they all lined up and started approaching and walking into the woods on the opposite side of the road. They were talking, but we couldn't make out what they were saying. I was worried that they would take their time looking for us since only a handful of people lived this far down the road, and it could have taken hours before another car would pass through. It took about five minutes of perfect stillness and silence before one did though. One of the guys had already placed my bike into the back of the truck, and then they noticed another car coming over the hill behind them. They quickly jumped into the truck and sped off. We waited at least 10 minutes before we stood up and started the walk back home. Although we walked right along the tree line instead of the road itself, just in case. My sister didn't say much to me, but told my mum when we got home that one of the boys that she had been hanging out with was talking about wanting to kill some of the annoying kids in the neighbourhood. And she assumed that it would be a good bet that one of those annoying kids might end up being one of her three younger siblings. It could have been any of us, but I was the one that wanted to go ride my bike alone that day instead of playing video games with my two brothers. She decided to head home when none of the other guys seemed to go against the guy talking about wanting to kill kids, or even jokingly, escalate his desire to kill annoying kids with more detail. She had been running home and just got enough of a head start before the boys hopped into their truck to stop whatever they might have done. The cops were informed, but apparently the boys disagreed 
and parents claimed they never left the trailer, so nothing ever came of it. I knew two of the boys' names, because we lived in the same neighbourhood in a small town, and I know they never got less evil. They later invited my sister to a bonfire party, everyone was going to be at, but my sister decided not to go, and when she asked all her friends how the party was, literally no one knew about it. This is because she was the only one they invited. She stayed away from them ever since, and fortunately, neither of us live there anymore. Of the two that I knew, one is currently incarcerated for several drug-related offences, but the other one is still out there. As for the other three that were in the truck, I have no idea where they are or what they're up to. So to the garbage boys in the truck, you can keep my bike, because I hope we never meet again. I am a female, who was 23 when this occurred back in 2016. I was moving from New York City to Boston. Two college friends, also female, agreed to live with me, and we started looking for an apartment. We were fond of one place in particular, out in the suburbs next to a forest park. I got talking with the landlord, an older man probably in his 70s, and mentioned that I repair antique dolls. He excitedly said he had a doll his mother's uncle had bought her back from Germany in World War I, and the elastic holding on the arms had worn out. I said I could definitely fix it, and we exchanged contact info. He was firm that my work would have to take place at his house since he was nervous about moving a fragile antique, but at the time I didn't think anything of it. Now that I'm older and wiser, I know doll doctor house calls are not the norm. Ultimately, we went with another place closer to the city proper, but I didn't want to lose a prospective doll repair client, and I called him a week or so after we got settled, and once again he seemed delighted to get his family heirloom fixed. Nothing seemed odd, until I asked for his address to work out how to get there. Don't worry, he said. I'll pick you up. What's your new address? My eagerness cooled a bit. I tried to put him off by saying that I didn't want to bring him out of his way, and I could get myself there no problem, but he kept insisting. Never even told me which town he lived in, just repeated over and over that it was fine, he'd pick me up, and that it would be no trouble at all. Eager for the business, and a bit embarrassed about my paranoia, I caved. I told him my address, and we arranged a date and time for him to pick me up. Over the next few days, literally everyone in my life told me to call and cancel. My housemates asked me if I'd lost my mind. My mum and sister both told me I was driving them mad with worry. And to be honest, I think I was looking for an excuse to call the whole thing off. It just didn't feel right. I called the evening before the appointed day, and left a message saying that something had come up. I added that if he was free the following Monday, my housemate could drive me over so he wouldn't be inconvenienced, which was true. She offered in a last ditch effort to make me see sense. The next day, the time we'd picked rolled around and I was sitting in the living room working on a sewing project when a car pulled up in front of the house. I looked down and my heart jumped when I recognized the old man sitting in the driver's seat. He didn't look up and didn't appear to see me and just sat there for what felt like a century until finally he started the car and drove off. I never saw him again, and he never contacted me about getting his mother's precious doll repaired. And maybe I was overreacting to an innocent old guy with poor social skills who forgot to call back. But I had a bad feeling about the situation, and ultimately, think I did the right thing. The part that creeps me out the most, is I almost had this man for my landlord. It could have been fine, or it could have been much, much worse. I am a short, medium-sized girl. One day around a year ago, I was pregnant and made a trip out to Target to buy some things. I'm a very cautious person and constantly looking at my surroundings with mild paranoia. Mostly inherited from my mum, who raised three kids on her own. She was always on her guard. I got out of the car, which I parked a little far away from the store entrance, for two reasons. I didn't want to get any dents from other drivers, and I tried to get as much exercise as I could since I was pregnant. As I'm walking, I notice a huge red truck with three men inside with the windows down. I assumed they were waiting for someone inside the store, 
but something creeped up my neck when I made eye contact with the driver. I quickly turned away and immediately began to feel self-conscious. A small girl, visibly pregnant, and I suddenly felt so vulnerable. Up until that point, my pregnancy was smooth and had never made me feel like a target. Once I finally got in the store, I felt more relaxed and went about my shopping. When I left the store and noticed the truck was still there, I put my bag in the trunk and got in the car and quickly turned it on and drove away. I noticed in my rear view mirror, the truck was also taking off with only the same three men inside. My heart sank. I realized they weren't waiting for anyone inside the store. I got in the lane that can only be a left turn and they were on a lane that can only go straight a few cars behind me. I thought, great, we're not going in the same direction and I was just being paranoid. As I passed the light turning, I see the red truck switch the lane I was in to turn left. I sped up to catch with the next light turning yellow to put as much distance between me and them. I drove a little faster than usual and realized even if I made it home, they could still follow me there and I would be going back to an empty home. So instead I drove past my street to a shopping center that had a Starbucks. The drive through wraps around the building so you aren't visible to the main road I was driving in. I'm getting into the drive through and notice the red truck going on the road I just left. They drive past the Starbucks and I think good. As I'm still in the drive through I see the truck pass by again in the opposite direction, almost as if they were looking for me. I wait in the drive through for the other cars to leave at this time. And I call my sister and tell her that I'm heading to her place as I didn't want to go home alone and my boyfriend wouldn't be home for several hours. As I'm driving to my sister's house, which is about 25 minutes away, my mind just begins to wonder, what would have happened if they'd have caught me? Had these men been following me from before? Any danger that could have happened to me or my baby made me so paranoid that I didn't leave my house for the remainder of my pregnancy. I was shaking by the time I got to my sister's and told her all the details I could remember. To the creepy man in that red truck, I've never seen you since, but please, let's not meet. My wife always tells me I need to make a book about the creepy things I've encountered. I co-owned a local delivery service. There was a woman called Sue who constantly did odd things upon delivery. She was a mid fifties, gray hair and solid mustache for a woman and creepy as hell. She progressively got worse it started with little odd things. She would say, have you ever tried beef? It's delicious. And come to the door with her face covered in grease and say, it's a new face treatment. One of my favorites was me miscounting change at the end of a long day. I realized my mistake and went to correct it. She matter of factly stated, laser beams to the back of your head make you stupid. And then slammed the door closed in my face. She once told me, I once had a party thrown for my many achievements. They turned a basement into a club for me. I go into the basement and there's hundreds of people applauding. When I turn around, Tom Hanks was there. And I said, Tommy, you get out of here. None of these were provoked or requested conversations, bear in mind. And she just went off and you'd have to stand there and nod along. It kept getting worse. She started tossing piles of garbage outside her townhouse and would drop piles of quarters out of her hand, which would roll into the trash pile and then ask you to pick them up. I told all the drivers to refuse and make her get more money. Then one day, it all hit the fan. As I parked, as there was enough blocking my car that she couldn't see where I parked, I hear her scream, Who are you? I knock, tell her the total, and she acts like she has the money, and has her hand closed and drops it in my hand. Nothing, I chuckle. She points to the ground, clearly dazed, and says, Money. There was something round on the ground, maybe a rock. I state it's not money, and she goes inside saying her friend will pay me. Confused, I question it, and she walks away with an odd look, saying she will find money, or he will pay me. I figure she's odd. Screw it. I'm waiting and waiting, and she's closed her glass door, but not the wooden door, 
and I open the door and holler, Sue, I need to get going, but there's nothing. I peek in to see if something's wrong, and I decide to open the door and go in. I turn to the right and see a couch with her feet sticking out from behind it. I assume Sue had had a heart attack and hurry towards her. As I approach, I hear her grunt like an animal but still only see feet. I round the corner cautiously and see Sue on her hands and knees digging into the ground like a dog. She was grunting and I see white spit foaming from her lips. She turns to face me and I've run faster than I ever had in my life. I jumped in my car and did 50 out of there. I called the cops to do a wellness check but never heard anything from it. I checked the papers for her name, nothing. What still weirds me out is that she called twice a day and never called again after that day. Still gives me the creeps. Soon, never call again. We will not go there and your existence haunts my dreams. This happened to me on New Year's Eve a year ago. I was at this party where a bunch of friends had gathered to just hang out, eat and celebrate together. Nothing crazy in particular happened during the event itself, but rather when I was on my way home. As I was walking along the sidewalk, I think it must have been about 3am or something, I saw this middle aged man coming in my direction. I thought little of it. I just assumed he was merely passing until I noticed that he was starting to slow down as we neared each other. I think he smiled as I walked past him. Not a crazy smile or anything, so I smiled back. Just as I thought that I'd been stupidly suspicious about this man, I heard him call out from behind me like he was after me. I stopped in my tracks and faced him to see what he wanted, and I saw him walking back towards me, his arms outstretched. As he stopped in front of me, he reached out his hands as if he wanted to shake mine. This was when I began to get a little more apprehensive about the situation. I'm sure he must have noticed how I hesitated before I decided to shake his hand. I don't want to be a suspicious person, but I considered the possibility that he might be concealing a knife in his sleeve, or his coat, or that he may try to mug me, or something worse. I thought about what would happen if I started to run. Would he just shrug and continue on his way, or would he follow? All of these thoughts flashed through my mind until I decided to take his hand. I thought that I could always pull myself free and run the hell away if necessary. He then started asking me stuff about what I'd been doing this New Year's Eve, if I had a good time, things like that. He was shaking my hand all the while, and even though I was still on edge, I started to realize this man didn't pose a threat to me. For politeness sake, I asked him if he had a good time too. After a short while, he let go, said Happy New Year, and went on down the sidewalk. He was probably under the influence, but he must have been one of those people who become happy when they're drunk. I felt stupid but relieved too, and continued on my way home. In the end, he didn't mean me any harm. Perhaps he was kind of sweet. I'll never forget the indecisiveness and spark of fear that ran through me at the moment that he stretched out his hand to me because who really knows what's going to happen when you meet a stranger. Every year my family gets together with friends to stay up until midnight on New Year's Eve and have a party. When we do, we usually shoot fireworks and burn our Christmas trees as a normal celebration of the new year. We live far out in the country and bonfires are normal. Across the street under the streetlight, there is this camp of sorts where people work. We set off our fireworks around midnight, and there's this guy standing under the streetlight, silhouetted, and he's glaring at us. He was just across the street but far enough away that we couldn't see his face, along with it being pitch black save for the light of the bonfire. I point it out, and it freaks us out a bit but we try laughing it off. After a while longer of shooting fireworks, we look back and he's still standing there. He wasn't there for a long time, just standing under the streetlight and it creeped us out. Me and the other kids would joke around and yell at him to mind his own business, but he stayed there and didn't stop staring at us. I remember him either laughing or whistling or something. We did it back for humor, but it was quite creepy. He was there for literally hours. Later on, we'd pretty much forgotten all about him. And looking back, he was gone. I don't know who he was or why he did that, 
This was a few years back. The street lighting he was under is still there today. And I have that very sinister memory. I wonder why he was there watching us for so long. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I profoundly hope that you enjoyed tonight's stories as well as the amazingly produced live action horror story by Dark Echoes. Please, please, please check them out. They're seriously underrated and I know you guys will like their work. So check out their videos, show them some love, let them know that I sent you, maybe put that in a little comment on one of their videos. I'd like that. Uh, and yeah, enjoy. Oh look, the link is on screen now. Go ahead and click it. It is some seriously good stuff. But for now, stay awesome. And I'll see you in the next one.